family of God. If you open your Bibles to James, which is our book for study on Sunday, we're looking at James. We're going to go back to the second chapter where they talked about the royal love, the royal law of love. And we're going to talk about where, why royal is important. In verse 8 and 9, James talks about if, however, you are fulfilling, taking responsibility in the application of what you've learned. If you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scriptures, and then he quotes you should, Leviticus 19, 18, of course, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, prejudice, bias, etc., you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. Now, if you want to know how bad that is, why, next week we'll talk about it in verse 10. I mean, you don't want to be under the law. You want to be under grace. You don't want to be under the old covenant. You want to be under the new covenant because under the new covenant, you have the power to fulfill the royal law of love. And the way you fulfill the royal law of love in the Old Testament of, of Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18, you know, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, is by the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit, not flesh. You cannot do that in the flesh. You can't reach the divine principle of the royal law, the divine principle of the royal law, apart from the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. So when Paul tells you in Galatians 5.16 to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, not the flesh, he reminds you in, in, in that same chapter in verse 22 and 23 that the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. We're not talking about the deeds of the flesh. We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And so here is a law that could not be kept in the flesh, could only be kept in the Spirit. Therefore, when you failed to do what the law required, it pointed you to Christ, didn't it? Galatians 3.24. This is what's very important about this kind of study. So today we're going to look, we're going to focus on the word royal, the royal law. We're going to focus on that word because the word that is used there is really important. So before I get into it, let's have a word of prayer. We know that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living, which means you can't study it nor apply it in the flesh. It can only be done in the Holy Spirit. And that's a very important principle because we live in the complete fulfillment of the entire word of God. Jesus something said something really interesting about this law of love, this royal law of love. He said upon these two commandments, Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18, Depend the entire covenant of the Word of God. Oh, we'll study it this morning. But you see, under the new covenant, we have the power through the Holy Spirit to fulfill everything that the Bible tells you about. We can fulfill the royal law of love that could never be been kept in the flesh in the Old Testament. It was always to point you to Christ. Your failure, your listen, your failure is always pointing you to Christ. If you learn nothing else this morning, your failures always should point you to Christ, who is the solution. We don't drop all the way back into prophecy. We drop, we drop back to the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Christ to set our guide on for how we live the Christian life. It is out of that principle that the fulfillment, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to what? Fulfill. Fulfill it. We are not about the law except by living in a higher law, under the higher law of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we fulfill it. Well, looks like I'm bound to preach whether I want to or not. So the Bible is a spirit <laughs> for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't do it. You can't. Learn it nor apply it in carnality. It's not written that way. But you can learn it. You can apply it under the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church age of the new covenant in which you and I live. So I'm going to give you a moment to confess your personal sins. How do we get out of carnality and into spirituality? You must confess your sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of tongue, avert sins. 
should do that in privacy prior to study. Let's pray. I give you a moment in your priesthood to confess sin if necessary. That's according to 1 Peter 2, your priesthood. 1 John 1, 9 talks about confession. Because we have the work of Christ on the cross in the cleansing work of the believer to get us out of carnality and into spirituality of 1 John 1, 9. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way this morning to study with us. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth. Nothing but the truth, so help us, God. We've heard that principle all of our life as people put their hand in the Bible in the old day and used to live, lift the right hand to God. We've come a long way from that today. We don't lift our hand and put our hand on the Bible. We don't even have a Bible anymore. We don't lift our hand to God. We lift our fist. And somehow we think we're going to survive all this mess, Father, not apart from Christ. May we be that church, Father, that carries a clear message of the gospel and mechanics of salvation that people might know for certain with confidence that they are saved and secured forever in Jesus Christ. For we've made his, our prayer in his name. Amen. Well, here we are in the word royal. Now, I want you to pay a little attention to me in the first, in my introduction, because the word that's used here comes from Attic Greek. And what Attic Greek did for the Greek language was kind of important. They emphasized the purpose of suffixes. A suffix is something you find on the end of a Greek word. A prefix is on the front of it. And both of them are really important. For example, a lot of times you will see a, a prefix on the front of a word. It will be a preposition. And it will enlighten you to the meaning of the root word. It will give you another idea of how it can be applied to the Christian life. A suffix on the backside of a word is really important. And these are the two parts of the Greek language that work off a root. Always a, a word like we have here is B-A-S-I-L -A with an E. See that? Well, just look on the top of your paper there. You'll see that. See that? Look at the word. B-A-S-I-L. That's the root word. And then you have the suffix, I-K-O-S. That's a suffix. Now, in this word, there's no prefix, but there is a suffix. And what the Attic Greek did for us, it, these aren't just detached there for, for, for any reason. They're, they offer you enlightened ideas about the word. For example, in our lesson text on the word royal, it ends in an I-K-O-S. And the IKOS is really important, and in a minute, I'm going to explain that to you. For example, look at the next paragraph. For example, in James 2.8, the Greek adjective that's used is IKOS. See the IKOS? That's a suffix. It emphasizes as a suffix. Now, we know an adjective. An adjective is the same. But in this idea here, IKOS, it emphasizes the characteristics of a thing about the royal law. He's going to tell you something about royalty that's important when it says that's attached to the law, because royal is the adjective. So he's going to tell us, he's going to describe something about the law. It's the word royal. Agreed? Okay. Okay. Well, it is, anyhow. So you have the IKOS on it, and here's what it, here's what it does. What it does about the law, the word royal, what it does in the IKOS, it emphasizes the highest excellence. The highest excellence. The word royal means the highest excellence of the law. The royal law with the IKOS means the highest excellence. When you're dealing with God in His Word, then when you've got something in the Word of God, like law, and you add royal to it, you've just elevated with the IKOS to the highest degree which puts you with God. It's divine. It's a divine royalty. Now, you'll see that. 
as it, we progress with this idea. Let me also explain how different suffixes change ideas. Now, it doesn't change the root word, but it gives you another, especially an adjective that's in description, as a description of something. It, it, fo it allows you to focus on something a little bit different about it, just like the IKOS. Well, in 1 Peter 2.9, where you're dealing with royal priest, the word royal, it's the same root word, but notice it ends in an I-O-S. That's a suffix. Okay? It ends in an I-O-S. Now, you know that I-O-S is different than I-K-O. But why would they do that? It's also an adjective, a royal priest, right? So they're doing the same thing. They're using an adjective, but they change the suffix. When they change the suffix, it's, in, it's emphasizing the characteristic, like the other, but of a person, and this time means carried to the highest distinction. So when you're dealing with the priest, and you're looking at the Levitical priesthood, the priesthood under the law, just like the law here of Deuteronomy 6.5 or Leviticus 19.18, talking about the law, right? When he's talking about the priesthood here, it's elevated to a whole other, other perimeter, which is Melchizedek and Jesus Christ. Of the highest the highest you can go is the, what the Bible says the extreme is. And so the highest of distinction is that our priesthood, 2 Peter 2.9, is after the order of Melchizedek and the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the high priest of the church priesthood. It has nothing to do with birthrights or generations. It has nothing to do with Levi, the tribe, or anything. Are you with me? See, this, this, is what the, this is what the Attic Greek has offered us by adding suffix to ideas. Now, that should be of some help to you. To show you the superiority of the, of the new covenant over the old covenant. It should help you, for example, with the word love. Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. In this way, others will see that you're disciples of mine. Remember that? John 13, 33, 34 in there, 35. So we have the power to do that. We have the power in the Holy Spirit to bring that to the highest level of uh, excellence, don't we? Not in our strength, not in our power, not in our flesh, but in His. See, we should live in the highest of excellence because not because of the flesh, but because of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. The highest of excellence. Not based on our performance, based on the performance of the Holy Spirit and our reliance upon Him in our life. I hope you're getting it. Is it sinking in? And so these, these little something that's put in there isn't just stuck in there to fill up space unless we're talking about between our ears. That space between your ears, then this is pretty important. Now, well, and these are, two, these are adjectives. Now, when you take the same word, royal, and change the suffix on that root word. Listen, now I'm in my one, two, three, I'm in my fourth paragraph of introduction. I want to give you three additional ideas about the suffix. For example, in the base work, B-I-S-L-E, -B when you add a U-S to it, it means king. It refers to a king. It's a noun, not an adjective, not describing something. 
person, place, or thing. Now, it, it's a noun. Notice also, when you add an I-A, the same word, you change the sub. Do you see the I-A? Okay. It means kingdom. doesn't mean king. It means the kingdom of the king. You got that? It means kingdom. It means the kingdom of the king. Now, let me show you how these words were used. And they're really dynamic. In, in Matthew 2.2, 2, the Magi come in town. You know, the travelers from the east. You know what they ask? Is that we've come to worship the king of the Jews. We're looking to where, 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 where can you point us towards him? Now, the best people in the whole wide world that should be able to point you to Jesus Christ would be the who? Jews. But in the old dispensation, in the new dispensation, you know who should be the best to point you to Christ? The Christian church. They should be the first and most accurate to point you to Christ, right? And you know where they're going to point you? To the cross. That's our hysterical. hysterical. That's our, <laughs> our historical point. I'm living proof anybody can do this, ain't I? That is living proof. So, so when you change that little suffix on the end of that word, that's the only thing he's done is change it, means king. When you change it again, it means kingdom. Both nouns. We're dealing with nouns. This time, it is used in John, the third chapter, 3 through 5, that very famous passage with Nicodemus. He says, Un unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he goes on in verse 5, it says, unless you enter, you will. It, you might, he says, you, unless you are born again, you cannot enter, what? The kingdom of God, right? So when you have that I-A in it, that's what that's doing. You see, then the, the same root word, the suffix on the end changes the concept of it. It gives you a different direction to look at. One more, and that's the verb, same word, that's dealing with royal. When you add an a U, uh, e u o or a u o on the end of it, or uh, in this case u o, then you have the word reign. You've got a king and a kingdom reigning. A king and a kingdom reigning. It is the reigning. It is the exercise of the king doing his responsible duty. This is found in Luke 1, 31, 33, through prophecy. When Gabriel comes to speak to Mary about the child she's going to give, uh, become pregnant and give birth to, Gabriel talks about that he is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant out of 2 Samuel 7th chapter. And he talks about that she will have that she will bear, the, listen to this, it's important, the son of the most high. See, that's what the writers were doing. This most high, the highest excellence, that's what they were doing. She's going to have the son of the most high, God, who is going to take Possession of the throne of his father, David, with a little f. With a little f. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. Now watch this. Watch this. And his kingdom will be forever. Now something has got to happen once he comes into the world in order for him to set, if he comes in the world by human form, something's got to happen so that he can sit on a throne forever. Right? That's a word of prophecy out of the Davidic covenant. He's got to be able to sit on David's throne 
forever. So something has to happen from his birth because, listen, Jesus' age grew just like the rest of us. He was one year old. He was 12 years old. He was 33 years old. You understand? We, we, we're given details of his aging, his birth, age 12 and 30 and beyond. <clears throat> he starts his ministry when he's 30. <clears throat> we're told that in the scriptures. So he, he's going to be born of a unique man, undiminished deity and true humanity in one person forever, hypostatic union. <clears throat> but he's going to be, he's going to be, the deity is going to be indwelt with humanity, and humanity is going to have a clock. He's going to be born. He's going to die. Now, we all know that, don't we? You're, you do know that. Well, you need to go back and, and read Ecclesiastes' third chapter again. That, that you know, they, you know, even the even the... The people that tell great jokes, they talk about that and ta death and taxes, right? Well, everybody understands that. But listen, if you're not careful, you're going to miss the important part of this prophetic, this, this Davidic prophetic covenant of Jesus Christ. He's going to be born as a, a human, a divine human, into the world with a clock that's counting down like all of us towards death. And yet he, he's, got to be, he's got to be able to sit on David's throne forever. When he sits on David's throne, he's in a forever state. And the only way he's going to do that, he's going to go to the cross and die for our sins, be buried and raised from the dead on the third day. He's going to spend 40 days in trying to establish the church with his disciples. He's going to ascend back to the Father, be seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Now he's ready to set on throne. He's already setting on one. He's ready to set on David's when he comes back the second time. Whoa. That's called the second coming. What is important about his first coming is he's going to be born through the house of David, the tribe of Judah and the house of David, right? But that's the genealogy of Matthew 1 and Luke 3. The house of David, the, the tribe of Judah, and the house of David. I mean, I mean he's, he can't be the Messiah unless, he's, unless he has that. Well, anyhow, I'm just showing you the added Greek a little bit. The odds are we're probably the only church in the universe today that would teach you that. I don't know. I'm just saying. Unless there's somebody else out there uh, that doesn't have any, anything else to do like me. That cares about this subject matter because of the way the translation into the English is. See, the root word of everything. We've talked about the king, the kingdom, the reigning, the royal. All of that works off the same base word, right? B-A-S-I-L. E. Basilia, we use that. The Catholics have used that word all over the place, Basilia. They understood this concept. I don't know how deep it is, but they understand it. They, they use words uh, in, their, in their structures. Well, anyhow, just telling you some of some of the importance of the Greek words. It's really important. Now, Listen, how much does that change your idea? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe a king is a king. Maybe royal is royal. I don't know what your frame of reference is for royal. But it's not like the royalty of David. It's not like the royalty of the queen of England. It's not royalty like that. We're talking about divine. We're talking about the highest level you can get, and that takes you to God. When we're talking about royal in the Bible... Connected to Christ, we're talking about the extreme. We're talking about divine. We're talking about divine royalty, a royalty that comes through Christ. It is of the highest excellency. It's of the highest distinction. You need to know that because that's who you are. That's who you are, not by who you become. It is by who you are in Christ. 
It has nothing to do with you building something out of yourself or anything. Let me talk about four things. I need to tell you how every church age believer becomes a royal member of the family of God. I'm going to talk about how. Point number one. The royalty of every church age believer is based on the divine royalty of Jesus Christ. See, that's the point of the Davidic covenant, isn't it? And it's mentioned a lot. Once Christ comes into the world, it becomes a buzzword. It may have been a lost doctrine before he came, but it, it was taken dust off the shelf and put into understanding. And the disciples are all over this idea. Especially after his resurrection from the dead, they got pretty excited about studying messianic teachings out of the Old Testament. And this, this become a buzzword, as they say. The royalty of every church age believer is not based on his flesh. It's based on his divine position in Christ Jesus. It is not based on human birth. It is not based on human merit. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. That's, you understand that? That's not how you get it. Now, I don't know if I wrote these on your paper. Did I write Romans 8 and 9, 8? Did I write that on your paper? Under point one, you need to write it. Here's what Romans 9, 8 says. We are not children of the flesh. We are children of the promise. We're not children of the flesh. We're not children of the flesh. You know, he's, you know who he's talking to in chapters 9, 10, 11? You know who he's talking about? He's, 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 he's talking to Romans, but you know who he's talking about? He's talking about the Jews who have lost their way dispensationally. They've lost their way. And there's going to be a terrible consequences for losing your way. And he writes chapter 9, 10, and 11. These are dynamite passages on the Jews. And here's one of the things they say. He, he says to the, listen to the Romans, you need to understand that the Jews, you're not a child because of the flesh. The Jews thought just because they were Jews, they were in. In fact, if you got saved by the gospel, they believed you had to become a Jew by circumcision to really make it. You'd never get to heaven without it. And so that a great controversy in Acts 15 came up. Are, 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 if we're saved by the law, are we kept there? Uh, if we're saved by grace, are we kept there by the law? See, they th that's what they believe. They believe that Jesus died for their sins, was buried, raised from the dead, and believe that you had to be circumcised in order to have that secured. Listen, it's secured because you're sealed by the Holy Spirit the moment of salvation, and you're sealed to the day of redemption. Ephesians 1, 13, 14, and 4, 30. Immediately in the church, we had a conflict over, okay, I believe you're, you're saved by the gospel, but you're only kept in the security by the law. That's why they required circumcision. They don't require anything like that. That's apostasy. And it was rightfully to be called out. That's wrong. Listen, there's two parts of the gospel, the, mechanic, the message and the mechanics. Your message has to be right, and your mechanics has to be right for salvation to occur. And if you don't believe it, go back and read Acts 15, because that was the cruncher. They settled that issue. However, the group that wanted law, salvation, and security went back to it. Never go back to the law for anything. Don't go back. Listen, you live in a higher, more supreme state in Christ, in the power of the Spirit, in the power of the Word of God. Don't ever go back to that. Romans 8, chapter verse 9. Romans 9, chapter 24. He says, it's not, it's not just the Jews that get in, but also the Gentiles. It drove the Jews nuts to think that the Gentiles could come into the kingdom of God by grace. It drove them nuts. And he said, well, you're just going to have to stay nuts for a while because 
in the church, in Jesus Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, male or female, yada, yada, yada. We got that straight, haven't we? This church has got that straight. And the fact that we have a straight doesn't draw any more people to us. Isn't that interesting? Well, preacher, if you start preaching that, you'll have all kinds of weirdos. I already got them. I'm looking for them. And listen, I'm the king of them. Listen, I knew when Christ took me in, he'd take anybody. Take anybody. I don't know how you feel about that in your life, but I can tell you that's the way I feel about it in mine. In Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 12, he says, In Christ there is no distinctions. Don't look down your nose on somebody that walks in here that looks different than you or smells different than you or dresses different than you or whatever. There is no distinction in Christ. Just make sure they're in Christ. You know, he can, he can clean your life up in ways nobody could clean it up. Isn't that true? He can do it. Listen to 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter 21 on your paper. God, he made him his beloved son who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. If that doesn't draw you into the kingdom, I don't know what would. God made, made his only begotten son sin on our behalf. And you think that you can offer God something that his son couldn't offer him in order to get to heaven? Well, uh, I believe the gospel, but I also believe you have to do this or do that or do this or do that or do this or that. Oh, yeah, really? God, really? God made his only begotten son to become sin on our behalf. You're going to add something to that that's important? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Why would you even do that foolishness? You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a what? It's a gift, church. It's a gift. And you know what? It's a gift that keeps on giving. Just in case you didn't know. And why did God do that on our behalf? So that we might become the righteousness of God in whom? In Christ, not in works. It's only when you understand your security in Christ that works can have a righteous conduct. Otherwise, you're always flipping on them. You're always pulling up the flesh to push you another mile. Just another mile for Jesus. The Pharisees asked Jesus in Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verse 36. The Pharisees came to him and asked him a question, tried to trap him. They said, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus gave the answer of Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. Now listen to me. And added a personal comment. You interested in that? Well, you ought to be. Because it's found in verse 40 which apparently you're not interested in. But it's found in verse 40. He made a personal comment. He said, On these two commandments depend the whole law and prophets. That's the whole Old Testament. That's the old covenant, lock, stock, and barrel. That's the whole kit and caboodle. Impossible. It's impossible. Then Jesus turned around and asked them two questions. He asked them the question in verse 42. He said to them, what do you think about Christ? Whose son is he? Well, they answered, 
son of David. Listen to me. That's human royalty. Human royalty can't sit on the David's throne forever. Come on now. Where did they get the idea that the Messiah was the son of David? They got it from 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 15 or 16. That's where they got it. And if they read it, they would know that when Christ comes into the world, he's got to sit on David's throne forever. That's a key word. I don't know how long you think forever is, but we're in another hemisphere, uh, another dinosphere, or some kind of sphere. <laughs> I'm not quite sure as I ran through them which one I'm in, but I know I'm not in this one. Okay? Whose son is he? They answered with human royalty, and listen, the English did right. They gave David the... If David's your father, they gave him a little F. <laughs> but you see, he can't sit on the throne if he's David's son. He can only sit on the throne forever. Now, he can sit on the throne because he's David's son, but he can't sit there forever unless he's the son of God. Forever is forever. You can throw your watch away. When you get into forever, when it runs and gets past 24, you can throw it away because now you're in forever. Well, how many hours in forever? There are none. I don't know. Then Jesus did something really important. So I want you to open your Bibles because I want your eyes on this. He asked them two questions. Nah, you always love when Jesus asks questions. Oh, boy. I call them gate, gate questions. That's where I got the idea. When he counters questions, he asks them questions. I figure, whoa, that's gate questions. That's where I got the idea. Now, I know it's kind of silly, but that's where I got the idea. In verse 22, he asked two questions. First thing I want you to do, you got your eyes on it? Find, listen, find the two questions. First of all, find the two questions, the two question marks. Have you got them? Look for them. Now, come on. We'll have a cup of coffee in just a minute and a sweet roll. Now, hang on here with me. Did you find the two questions? You got them? All right. Verse um, 43 and 44 is the first question. Are you with me? Do you see that? And then we got the next question is going to be in verse 45. Do you see that? All right, here we go. Say it's important you see that. Here's what he said. See, in verse, is, is, what do you think about the son? Who is he? the answer? The son of David. Then he says to them, he asked them two questions, right? He asked them two questions, two further questions. He said to them, then how does David in the Holy Spirit, that is writing prophecy, Call him Lord when he says, the Lord said to my Lord, hey, does your Bible put a capital L's on both of them? Ah, they should have. They should have. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put thine enemies beneath thy foot, thy feet. Listen to me. You got a study Bible? Look over in your reference col column. Do you see Psalms 110.1? Yeah. Do you know where that is? That's the second coming of Christ. This is that forever deal. Set up my right hand. I tell, listen, he's setting at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. When he comes back a second time, he's going to set on David's throne forever so to speak. Look at verse 45. He says, if David then called him Lord, and he did, did he not? Should have two capital L's up there. You know, listen to me. You know how Jesus became Lord? 
other than, other than birth identity, do you know how he became Lord? Raised from the dead. Nobody called him Lord until he was raised from the dead, and then everybody called him the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> when they referred to him as Lord in the humanity, when they referred to him as Lord, it was prophetic. When they referred to him after the resurrection, it's all, it's all experiential. He's the Lord Jesus Christ, raised from the dead by the power of God, exalted to the right hand of God the Father, where he sets for eternity. That's a whole different ballgame. Well, look at point two. Jesus answered with two, oh, that was that royalty. That, listen, that's that royalty part. Point number two, every church age believer becomes a member of the divine royal family of God the moment he believes that Jesus died for his sins, was buried, and raised from the dead on the third day to give him eternal life. You know, we put this on our screen all the time, you know, where you put the cross and then you bring it down to the burial and up to the resurrection. Then you put a dot by the cross and you put a line straight up and you put a, a circle up there in Christ, positional sanctification. You know what gets you from the point? Listen, when you believe, you receive. When you believe, you receive. When you believe, you receive. When you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, you receive. What do you receive? You receive 50 things in the package of grace salvation you can never lose in time and eternity. hoo -ah. Do you know how you get with your feet on earth into Christ to a seat at the right hand of God the Father? You know how you get there? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is it something you do? No, it's something he does. At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into union with Christ, and you become a new creature in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I mean, you become a new creature in Christ. Are you familiar with the 20 status privileges you receive? Part of it's your royalty. Do you know that? Do you know how you got it? You got it because grace. You got it by grace. You ought to live it. We live as paupers. And positionally, we're royalty. We're divine royalty. And we live like paupers. We have an inheritance ready to be, ready to be used up. We don't write any checks. Well, I just, you know, I can't give anything because... I don't have anything. How is that possible? You're living like a pauper. You're royalty. How is that possible? How is it possible that you have nothing? Yes, you have everything. It's called the inheritance. And listen, you have an escrow account. You can never spend enough, but you have to spend it the right way. You have to spend it according to the will of God. You draw out and spend, he puts back in. See, you think you'd really be rich if you won the lottery. No, because you're a pauper. You live like a pauper. It wouldn't matter how much you have. You live like a pauper. You'd never live into the royal, the royal wealth. You have royal wealth, and you live in poverty. How is that possible when God tells you in Philippians 4.19, I will meet your needs? How is it possible you would be in poverty? Why would you be on the street when you have a palace? Why is that possible? Bad choices. You're not thinking divine viewpoint. And here's a mistake you made. You think if you can gather your wealth and put it someplace and keep building the barn up, you're secure in life. Well, I can retire because I'm secure. You should retire because you're unhealthy to work. Now, if you want to manage your wealth, that's a whole different thing. This crazy idea in America... That the goal in your work is to retire is nuts. 
and all you will die is die an old man because you got nothing to get up for every morning. The saddest people I ever meet in my life are those who have no purpose. They retired without any purpose in life. And all they do is just mold away. A mold will get you. Why will you do that? Look, if you don't want to go back out into the free enterprise system, I understand that. If you're independent wealthy, I understand that. Do something for my goodness. Do something. Go on a mission trip. If you can't find anything to do, call me. I'll tell you some things to do. Work in the kingdom. Work in the kingdom. There is so much work to be done. Listen, I'm going to close as far as I'm going to get today on this one. One of the most interesting conversions that I have ever read about, it's typical of Jesus though, is the way Jesus introduces people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and works them into their salvational need. You know, anybody who sells a product knows you have to create a need. Right, Bill? If you ain't got a product that fits a need, you got people you're going to pay, they ain't going to do nothing. <laughs> if they never understand they have a product that people need and don't know how to sell that product into that need, they ain't going to make no money. You never sell any product. Listen, Jesus used this in a masterful way. When he dealt with Nicodemus, two, two of them, listen, third chapter and the fourth chapter, you study those two, what he did in those two chapters, he dealt with Nicodemus, a guy who thought he was superior, and he dealt with a Samaritan woman who thought she was on the last rung of humanity. He dealt with one guy who thought he was at the top of the, of the heap, and she dealt with another one that was underneath of the heap. Dealt with a Samaritan woman in four and dealt with Nicodemus in three, and he dealt with them both the same way if you pay attention. He had a product, and he met their need. He had to find, find a way to show them that his product met their need. When he dealt with Nicodemus, when you read the story of Nicodemus, which is, listen, everybody quotes one verse, 316, but it goes to 21. 